Hey everyone, this lesson is on irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. In this lesson, we're talking about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about causes of this condition. We're also going to discuss signs and symptoms of this condition. We're also going to talk about the Bristol stool chart, how we can make the diagnosis, and how we can treat IBS. So IBS is a functional bowel disorder characterized by intermittent and chronic abdominal pain associated with changes in bowel habits. We're going to discuss in more details what all these words mean. The epidemiology of IBS is very significant. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of people in the Western world are estimated to be affected by IBS, but it is a worldwide phenomenon and it appears to be increasing in prevalence worldwide. It's likely very underdiagnosed. Many individuals that have IBS or that could be diagnosed officially with IBS do not present to a healthcare provider. And even though it's likely underdiagnosed, it's still the most commonly diagnosed gastrointestinal disorder. So it's a very significant problem. And IBS generally has an onset in young adulthood. Now, IBS is associated with certain conditions, and a lot of these conditions can have interplaying roles with IBS. So IBS can worsen these conditions, and these conditions can worsen IBS. Some of these conditions include fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux disease, major depressive disorder, anxiety, and somatization. So what is the pathogenesis of IBS? The etiology of IBS is generally unknown. There is no organic cause for IBS, but it is considered what we call a functional bowel disorder. We do know that there are issues with gastrointestinal motility, so there's disturbances in this process. We also know that there's visceral hypersensitivity and an altered perception. So individuals have a disturbed gastrointestinal motility, but also are hypersensitive and have an altered perception of their gastrointestinal system. And what is interesting is that psychiatric symptoms can precede onset of GI symptoms. So we talked about major depressive disorder disorder, anxiety, and somatization, well, some of these symptoms can actually precede the onset of GI symptoms. So there is some connection going on here. Other factors that are likely responsible for the onset and exacerbation of IBS include intestinal inflammation. IBS patients have been found to have increased lymphocytes and mast cells within their gastrointestinal system. There's also been found to be disruptions in fecal microbiome. A lot of times there can be bacterial overgrowth. Some species can be in high amounts than other species. There's also likely some sensitivity to certain foods and certain nutrients. And there's also something called post-infectious IBS. So individuals that have been previously infected with E. coli 0157H7 and Campylobacter bacteria have a irritable bowel syndrome symptoms after infection. So there does seem to be some role to play in some infectious processes as well. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of IBS? Some of the main features of IBS include abdominal pain that is associated with defecation. This abdominal pain is described as cramping in nature and it can be variable in intensity and location. So any intensity of pain can occur. The pain can occur in any abdominal location. And the pain is generally exacerbated by meals and stressors. We've talked about some of these psychiatric symptoms that can actually precede and exacerbate abdominal pain. And the second main feature of IBS is a change in stool frequency and or consistency and generally it can be diarrhea and or constipation. So those are the two main features. Abdominal pain that's associated with defecation and a change in stool frequency, so more often, and or consistency, diarrhea and or constipation. So with regards to the diarrhea, it's most often occurs in the morning or after eating. It's preceded by lower abdominal pain and sense of urgency with a possible sensation of tenesmus or a feeling of incomplete evacuation. And the constipation can be significant the bowel movements can be pellet shaped and they can also have a sensation of tenismus as well. And other associated symptoms include straining, urgency, and tenismus. So we've talked about tenismus multiple times. It's that feeling of incomplete bowel movement. And then the straining and urgency can also be associated as well. There can be a passage of mucus and there can be bloating and abdominal distension. So these are all very common associated symptoms. And what is interesting about IBS, and we've talked about this before, symptoms can be altered by emotional, so straining stress, psychiatric symptoms, depression, but it can also be altered by social and cultural factors. So depending on where an individual might be in the world, in different cultures and in different societies, they can experience this abdominal pain differently. So it's very interesting. There's a lot of things that can alter and affect how an individual senses and experiences symptoms of IBS.
So the next thing I want to discuss is the Bristol stool chart. We need to understand the Bristol stool chart in order to make the diagnosis of IBS. So the Bristol stool chart is a way we can describe a bowel movement. There are seven different types. The first type is considered constipation. It is separate hard lumps like nuts. So the bowel movement is separate but like hard lumps. So it's almost like what we would call rabbit poop. Type two is when the bowel movement is sausage shaped but lumpy. Type three is sausage shaped with cracks on the surface. Type four is like a sausage or snake. It's smooth and soft. This is generally what we call a normal bowel movement. Type five is when there are soft blobs with clear cut edges. Type six is fluffy and mushy with ragged edges. And type seven is watery and entirely liquid. So this is essentially diarrhea. In a way in which to remember is diarrhea on one end of the chart and is constipation on another end of the chart, think about this. The higher the number Number on the Bristol stool chart, the more water content the stool has. This is how I remember the Bristol stool chart. So you might not necessarily remember every small detail of this chart, but it's important to recognize the extremes of the chart. So again, the higher the number, the more water content the stool has. So at the high end of the Bristol stool chart, type 7 is essentially watery, entirely liquid stool. So how do we make the diagnosis of IBS? The diagnosis of IBS is based on history. We can have a patient track their bowel movements so we can have a bowel habit journal so we can have the patient essentially write out the frequency consistency of their stool and also associated abdominal pain that can help us with the diagnosis and then we use what is called the Rome 4 criteria the Rome 4 criteria are a set of criteria based on the history of symptoms that will help us make the diagnosis of IBS symptoms have to occur at least one day per week in the past three months so at least one day per week for at least three months and what are these symptoms. The symptoms include abdominal discomfort or pain and that abdominal discomfort or pain is associated with at least two of the following. One, that the pain is relieved or is related to defecation. Two, the pain is associated with a change in stool frequency. Or three, the pain is associated with a change in stool consistency. So these symptoms have to occur at least one day per week over a span of at least three months. So at least one day per week of abdominal discomfort that is associated with two of those three criteria we talk about, and it has to occur each week for at least three months. That's the Rome 4 criteria. That's how we make the diagnosis of IBS. So once we make the diagnosis, there are other symptoms that support the diagnosis as well. So with regards to change in frequency, the change in frequency is generally more than three times per day in the diarrhea type or less than three times per week in the constipation type. So I'm going to discuss how we make the diagnosis of IBS subtypes in the next slide. So it's not exactly exactly diagnosed like this, but this might help you with the IBS diagnosis. The change in consistency of stools occurs with more than a quarter of bowel movements. And there's also a change in sensation. And this change in sensation is generally urgency and tenismus that occurs with more than a quarter of bowel movements as well. And there can also be a passage of mucus that occurs more than a quarter of bowel movements. And there can be a sensation of bloating. So what can you take from all of this? Generally speaking, if there's more than a quarter of the bowel movements that are affected by a change in consistency, a change in sensation, passage of mucus, and you also have changes in frequency and the sensation of bloating, this is also going to help support the diagnosis of IBS. But before we move on from diagnosing IBS, what is important to recognize is that IBS is essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to rule out any red flag symptoms before we officially make a diagnosis of IBS. So red flag symptoms include the following. If the symptoms occurred with an onset after age 50, that's a red flag symptom because as I mentioned before, the onset of symptoms symptoms occurs in young adulthood, if there's anemia involved, if there's a fever involved, malaria or hematochesia, nocturnal defecation, unexplained weight loss, and laboratory abnormalities, all of these are red flag symptoms that we need to ensure there's nothing else going on. And we need to rule out similar conditions that can cause some of these red flag symptoms. These include infections, so it can be things like entamoeba histolytica. We need to rule out inflammatory bowel disease, lactose intolerance, celiac disease, diet-induced diarrhea, obstruction 
obstruction and malignancy. So these are conditions we need to rule out before we can make official diagnosis of IBS. So I mentioned about IBS subtypes. How do we make the diagnosis of different types of IBS? There is IBS that is IBS with predominant diarrhea or IBSD. So as its name suggests, it's primarily diarrhea. So Bristol types six and seven. And to make the diagnosis, more than 25% of bowel movements are Bristol types six and seven. And less than 25% of bowel movements are Bristol types one and two. So this is how we make the diagnosis of IBS hyphen D. There's also IBS with predominant constipation or IBS C. So this is again, primarily constipation. So it's on the opposite end of the Bristol stool chart, Bristol types one and two. In order to make the diagnosis of this subtype, we need more than 25% of bowel movements that are affected to be Bristol types one and two, and less than 25% of bowel movements that are affected are Bristol types six and seven. There's also IBS with mixed bowel habits, which is IBSM. This can have alternating diarrhea and constipation. So essentially it is more than 25% of bowel movements are Bristol types six and seven, and more than 25% of bowel movements are Bristol types one and two. More than 25% of two sets of diarrhea and constipation that are affected and are associated with abdominal pain. And there's also IBS unclassified. This is essentially a diagnosis when there is the change in stool consistency is really not sufficient enough to make or to categorize the diagnosis. So again, IBS with predominant diarrhea, IBS with predominant constipation, IBS with mixed bowel habits, and then there's an IBS unclassified. How do we manage IBS? So there are a set of goals common for all types of IBS. One is to increase our fiber intake to about 30 grams per day. You can use bran or psyllium, or you can just do it through diet. We also want to have a low fog FODMAP diet. So what is FODMAP? FODMAP is fermentable oligo dye and monosaccharides and polyols. So these can all lead to bloating and abdominal distension. So we want to reduce foods that are essentially a part of this diet. We also want to avoid lactose, gluten, and excess caffeine. So these dietary selections may not be the exact cause of IBS, but IBS patients may be slightly sensitive to these dietary selections, so it's best to avoid them. The fourth goal is to increase physical activity. This can also help with IBS symptoms. And the fifth is stress reduction. We've talked about this before. Stress and other psychiatric symptoms can worsen or cause IBS, so we want to reduce stress. Now, there are several more specific goals depending on the specific IBS subtype. So IBS with diarrhea, we can use lopiramide as a possible medical treatment for symptoms. We can also use cholestyramine. So these can both help with diarrheal symptoms. And with the subtype of IBS with constipation or IBS type C, we can use linaclidide or laxatives like lactulose and PEG to help with those symptoms. And for symptoms of bloating and flatus, we can use alpha-galactosidase, probiotics, and even antibiotics. Semethicone can also be used. With regards to IBS-related pain, this can be its own specific issue. We can use tricyclic antidepressants. Some examples are amitriptyline, so these can actually help with just the pain. And rifaximin can also be used. The antibiotic rifaximin can be used if an individual is unresponsive to other treatments. So if we've basically used the treatments I've listed here and there still doesn't, it's still not helping them, we can actually give a trial of rifaximin. And some other indications for IBS include alternative treatments. Some of these include hypnosis. So hypnosis can be used to treat IBS in some cases. Relaxation therapy. So this makes sense if we want to reduce stress, this may help with that. Biofeedback as well. And probiotics can also be used to help with some IBS symptoms. The prognosis of IBS is interesting. So generally speaking, symptoms appear to improve with increasing age. 80% of individuals have improvement of symptoms over time. The IBS subtype itself may actually change over time. So an individual might have IBS with constipation and then switch to an IBS with diarrhea or vice versa. And even with significant symptom burdens, individuals with IBS generally have a normal life expectancy. So if you wanna learn more about other gastrointestinal conditions, please check out my gastrointestinal playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.